Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal. And I'm here today with my old friend in hockey, Bruce McCurdy. Not hey, my hey. old my old friend in hockey. I don't I'm not calling you old. I'm calling you my old friend. Okay. We've been, we've been okay. friends a long time now, Bruce. I'm old. I can deal with it. <laughs> That's the good thing about getting old. You don't care anymore, eh? It's like whatever. Say whatever you want. I don't care. Um Big trade today, Bruce. Ryan Strom. We hardly knew you mm. of the Edmonton Oilers to the New York Rangers for Ryan Spooner. Two players with the same initials and oddly similar games, I think, Bruce. Kind of uh, underperforming offensive hockey players who um, maybe are centers, maybe are wingers, both relatively the same age, close to one year apart in age. Um, both on their is both on their third team now yep. um, in the NHL and yep. both running out of chances as NHLers, but both on fairly hefty contracts yes. still. So Bruce, what is your, you wrote about this. What is your take on your initial take on the deal? The trade is one for one. And it's, uh, as you say, Ryan S for Ryan S uh, the thing about this trade, I mean, I'm sure there will be immediate solid line connections drawn between Ryan Spooner and Jordan Everly, uh, given as how Strom was just kind of the middleman of the two one-for-one -one trades. Uh, the significant difference being the cap savings of close to $3 million. Uh, the Rangers uh, ate uh, the difference between uh, the two contracts, Spooner makes, a, they just signed him too, two years, four million per, based on a hot run that he had last uh, spring with the Rangers. They got they got him only at last year's trade deadline in the Rick Nash trade. And he got hot right away in Boston. He had 13 points in eight games, and then he finished with three points in his last 16 our last 12 games and then this here two and 16 games so he's really cooled off after a real super hot start 13 points in eight games he was on a roll he was getting two points it seemed like every game and he is uh a, certainly a more offensive accomplished nhl uh offensive player than ryan strome uh but he apparently has his uh weaknesses on the defensive side of the puck which is one area where Strom had actually shown significant signs of improvement. Yeah, I I had really liked Strom on the penalty kill, Bruce, and I feared the Oilers might actually miss him quite a bit on the penalty kill. I think he's been an effective penalty kill penalty killer for since he was moved there about uh, in midwinter last year. He really made a difference. He's got a good stick uh, on the penalty kill, and had I thought generally done a really strong job on the power play. Strom had been. <laughs> Did not he was part of a power play unit. He's part of a second power play unit that's averaging a minute a game and has so far manufactured in 18 games three grade A scoring chances, Jeez. which is which is terrible. That's just terrible. And part of the problem was, and again, this is my old beef with the Oilers. Like they have. <laughs> They don't have Strom on his off wing. They don't. Have, they didn't like they did last year. They had him on his off wing, and he was getting off grade A scoring chances. They didn't have him on his off wing um, this year. Nor the nor the player on the other side, who was Reader or Kajula or whoever they had over there, wasn't on his off wing. I don't understand that in the least. It makes no sense to me because these guys couldn't get a. They had much less of a chance to get off a good shot on the power play. The second unit has been absolutely abysmal. So the Oilers maybe will get a better player in Spooner. Well, for the he power is a, play. He is a proven power player. You know, uh, he's played uh, of his 660 career points, no fewer than 53 of them have come with the man advantage. Like that's fully a third of his uh, career points. Whereas Strom only scored about 1.5 on the power play. He also has almost the same number of points in about 70 more games, Strom. So Spooner is a. Uh, I think he's about 0.55 points per game, Strom about 0.45, and that difference can be found on the power play where Spooner was uh, was a useful player. Whether he'll find any space on the order's first unit is doubtful, but he may well be a, uh, a mainstay of the second unit power play, and uh, God knows they need somebody uh, to uh, <clears throat> get that thing in work in order because it's been a mess, like you say. Strom's a, 
I didn't mind him at even strength. I mean, he 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 seemed to be a player who could offer more than he than he gave. He just seemed to lack a little bit of confidence or determination or something as an NHL player or wingers. Um, yeah, he just. Um, I mean, it's it's. I don't think you're going to find too many people mourning this trade, thinking, "Oh, no. terrible thing that Ryan Strom's leaving town," and mm-hmm. boy, the orders are going to miss Ryan Strom. I mean. If Spooner can't play center, and he should, certainly doesn't look like he can take faceoffs, forty-three percent, and he doesn't take very many faceoffs. He seems like more of a winger than a center, and the others could suddenly be a little weak down this the middle. But this, I think, might be an indication of, and I don't want to read too much into it, but maybe the, this organization is pretty bullish right now on Cooper Marody. Marody has been chewing it up in scoring at the AHL level, just in a sh- small sample size of games. But uh, when he was here for two games at Edmonton, he made, I thought every time he touched the puck, he made a good play. He's been playing center. He played center in uh, U.S. college hockey. He played center, I believe, in the AHL on a line with Benson and um, Cameron Hebig, if I'm not mm-hmm. mistaken. Maybe yeah. Hebig was the center, but I think it was Marodi. No, it was Marodi. And um, I really like Cooper Marodi. And, and do I think Cooper Marodi could get more than a one point in 16 games at center? Yeah, I, I do, actually. I think he's... He's got a lot of smarts. I'd actually like to see him on the wing with Ryan Nugent Hopkins. I think that would be a better role for Cooper Marodi, two smart hockey players combining. But I, maybe this is as, I don't know. I mean, clearly they think something of Spooner if they're bringing in a guy. He's got what a two-year deal at $4 million per. Yeah, well, Bruce. I mean, we, we can consider it a two-year deal at 3.1 and forget all about what he's actually Yeah. Getting. The fact is the Rangers badly overvalued him. And b- badly enough that they were quick to move on and eat some salary after, you know, what a quarter, less than a quarter of a season into a two-year deal, and they're already sick of the player. And for sure, he's got some bad underlying numbers, David. Since he went to, with the with the Bruins, he was somewhere north of fifty percent uh, on ice uh, shot share. And this is strictly a matter of playing with better players. Once he went to New York, and he wound up. Uh, on a weaker team, his shot share plummeted below 40%, which is terrible. Yeah, of course he measures the group of players that you're playing with. It does, but it also uh, measures you, and and you're, I mean... You're one uh, of them. You're one of the five. Uh, So there's some waiting to be done there, but a lot of the waiting is how good are the guys you're playing with, and in the case of New York Rangers, even when he was posting good numbers last year, uh, his line was getting shot, it was getting crushed in terms of possession. I mean, 40%, you're talking about three shots against for every two, four. And unless so you're shooting know, the lights out. Yeah. I know very little about, I, I mean, I can't remember seeing him play. Like I'm, I've seen him play with the Rangers and the Bruins, but you know, it doesn't stick out in a memory. I have no memory of him playing. But when you look at his stats, Bruce, one thing really sticks out with Ryan Spooner. And that's whenever he goes to a new place, whether it's major junior, he was a in terms of his points per game, Bruce, he was about the same in his first year of major junior as he was in his last year, four years later. Mm-hmm. He goes to the AHL, and again, as a first year player, he's a point per game guy close yep. to it. By his last year, he's a little less than that, three yep. years later. In the NHL, he comes in strong and he and he and again he's he he levels off after that. New York, he's strong and he so he seems to be a player who's got motivation issues who who will make his come in, make his mark, look good for a time, but then he gets satisfied or or they get tired, like maybe they didn't get the off offensive opportunity for some reason, but something happens and he never he never raises his game. And it happened it's happened repeatedly in every place he's been as a hockey player. So that's an interesting trend with Ryan Spitter. But maybe it means that we'll get two or three good months out of the guy. And um that's certainly what the old Todd McCullen could use right now. Um in uh, keeping his job, so uh, maybe that'll maybe or maybe they're just trying to shake up the orders. I mean, I don't honestly particularly understand this trade, other than it's just like sh- shaking things up and seeing what's going to fall out. What do you? Well, how do you read it? I mean, why would you make this trade? Uh, Shirelli, Shirelli does Shirelli does know the player because, yeah. of course, he was drafted by Boston in 2010 uh, when Shirelli was right in the heart of his. Uh, uh, nine-year run as uh, Bruins GM, and he was already he was establishing himself in Boston before Shirley got fired in 2015. 
Uh, so, you know, it was, he wasn't exactly an unknown commodity. So Shirley would have some inside knowledge of him. Now, whether that's a good or bad thing, who knows? I mean, sometimes, you know, trades get made because of what people remember, what a guy used to be like years ago. Griffin Reinhardt comes to mind. Um, or they, but maybe, you know, I mean, he also picked off Matt Benning from, I think, that same 2010 draft that never signed with Boston but wound up here in Edmonton. And I still think it's going to be a useful player for the Oilers even though some beg to differ. Uh, Spooner, I mean, wait and see. I mean, I he caught my eye in Boston. He used to wear 51 in Boston, and he struck me as an opportunist. You know, he'd get a chance, and the puck would wind up in the net, whether it was him shooting or much more often somebody else. Like, he's uh, he's much more an assist, a sister than a goal scorer, and he's had more than two assists for every goal, basically – all the years that he's been a full-time NHLer and his career rates about 2.5 assists for every one goal with a similar ratio on the power play. And that just, you know, playmaking seems to be uh, his, his uh, forte. So, we'll so here, here's I mean, my who are you going to put him with? Who are you going to put him with? That's going to finish those plays. I mean, who do the orders have? Who Ratty? Goal Ty Ratty? Maybe. Drysidel? Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe Drysidel and Ratty. Like, um, maybe that's your second line for a while. See how that goes. Or this, how about this, Bruce? Spooner's a left shot. Maybe this he's the start of a five-man left shot second power play unit. Well, there you go. You can have <laughs> ten left shots on the two power plays. How about if he's, uh, uh, how about if uh, Drake Kajula cools off and you're looking for another left winger to put up with uh, McDavid and Dreisaitl on line one and you have a playmaker? You know, I'm I mean, totally not sold on Drake Kajula in that role. So if well, it can happen sooner than later, as far as I'm concerned. You've got Ty Ratty now. You've got another log on the fire, right? A guy who can score some points, has a history of being an offensive player. Uh, let's, you know, uh, my, my, you know, my ultimate take is, this, frankly, the same as it usually is. Uh, I think it's mighty early to judge a trade today. Uh, I'd rather watch the guy play, say, two or three games before going way out on the limb and declaring it um, one way or the other. And I, I, I completely agree. What what we can really offer today, Bruce, is um, what we can offer today is, you know, assessment of Ryan Strom for Ranger fans. And mm -hmm. and um, so I guess the fact that neither of us are weeping tears is uh, not a good sign for Ranger fans. But he, he's not a terrible player. And it, it used it sparingly as a third line player, and on the penalty kill, I think he can help a team win. I don't, I don't think he's a any kind of difference maker, and he's unlikely to be at this age. But um, presumably, the Rangers know him pretty well too, having played across town for uh, the first several years of his career. Yeah. So Bruce, let's deal with quickly with a couple other subjects. So Miko Koskinen, as opposed to Cam Talbot in the nets yeah Koskinen uh, starts tomorrow yeah and um i was i can't remember i think i was who i was hearing talking about that maybe craig simpson was talking to stoffer and simpson was saying that would be significant if Koskinen. it was significant that Koskinen got the montreal start it would be significant in simpson's mind who in simpson being an expert in in the pecking order uh, of nhl teams and how things work with nhl teams where the G the coach sends out the message of who he has the most trust in because he gets the first game in a in a right. back to back. It's a higher profile game for sure. Hockey night in Canada, Edmonton, Calgary. Uh, I think it's the right call. And oh, definitely. I, it made sense that you're going to use both goalies this weekend, no matter what. Uh, but to me, Koskinen is the. Um, and I I hear lots of views to the contrary where. People just sort of default to the uh, this idea that Cam Talbot's the number one and Koskinen is the understudy. But honestly, David, I see them pretty much as equals at this point and not playing equal. Koskinen's been playing better than Talbot. So they're both, uh, you know, 30-year-old guys on their last year, and I've, I'm convinced between the two of them, one of them will get an extension. And Bruce, so I just go by competition. Yeah. I go by performance, and based on this year, it's not close. Mm -hmm. It is not close. Koskinen has clearly been superior to Talbot. McClellan himself was saying that Koskinen's play has the team feeling more confident about this player, having this player in net, or and uh, they're <clears throat> so. To me, this isn't this isn't close. Talbot has 
not performed well at all this year. He didn't perform that well last year. Mm -hmm. You know, why would anyone hold out that Cam Talbot is the number one guy at this point? He's, he, he hasn't earned the job for a significant run of time. And Koskinen has earned a shot at being the number one guy. I mean, if it wasn't, if it was back to back games, if it was one game day off and then another, I would say play Koskinen both games, you know, um, let's see how he can do it when he gets a run of games, because uh, we know how Cam Talbot can do and it hasn't been great. So that's my, yeah, I, yeah. Yeah, I don't mind if they're going to have a back-to-back -to, -back to use both goalies, no matter which one. If Talbot was the number one guy, I'd still say the same thing. So I, I'm not going to. Yes, I agree. After this weekend, they start playing, you know, they play Tuesday, Friday, Sunday. So they could definitely go, go a run of games with one guy. And, I mean, Koskinen, I mean, he's played five games. Let's put it this way. The Oilers have won six games in regulation this year. And Koskinen has started five games, and he has four of those wins. And Talbot started 13 games, and he has two of those wins. So you could make the argument that Koskinen's got way better goal support, four goals per game, and Talbot's down the two-point whatever range. Uh, but you could also make the point that uh, uh, Koskinen has been running with the lead in part because he hasn't been trailing one nothing at the two-minute mark of the first period or what have you. And it's the other team playing catch up against the Oilers when Koskinen's been in net, and so the, that changes the dynamics of the entire game, really. So anyway, it's way too soon to judge off of five games. All I'm saying is that up to this point, his performance has been more encouraging than has Talbot's. Yeah, it's too soon to judge Koskinen after five games, and I, I think they're close enough, and it's enough of a coin flip that they should. I, I think the policy should be for the next while, like you you win and you're in kind of thing, except mm -hmm. for back to back games. But <laughs> the win and you're in policy, or at least play, you play well and you're in um, policy would would seem to make sense because you know Koskinen isn't like he's you know <laughs> we're not talking about Martin Brodeur. This is an unknown quantity, so if he if he doesn't play well, go with the other guy. If, he, if the other guy plays well, if Talbot plays well, stick with him. When he doesn't play well, go back to Koskin. And if he plays well, stick with him until he doesn't and have a real competition. Let's see who's a better goalie. And yeah. uh, let's see who can battle it out. Because, you know, well, you could say, well, this is too much pressure and you've got to pick a, pick a guy. Well, there's lots of pressure in the NHL at all times and in the playoffs especially. Let's see who can handle the pressure. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not a bad idea to, to have that kind of pressure. Um, so... The Toby Reader is out, Bruce, and they yeah. called up two players, uh, uh -huh. Patrick Russell and Marodi. Was mm -hmm. Marodi called up before Reader yes. got hurt? I think he was. Uh, but no, Marodi, he, oh, yeah, he was called he, up. He was, he was called up before. forward on Tuesday, and then Reader got hurt that night. He was called up in response to Yamamoto and Pulia Yarvi yes. being sent down. And uh, I think, actually, I'm going to subscribe to the AHL games again on online and start watching some of those They're games. Playing and tonight. They are playing tonight, and maybe I... We'll see what else is on TV, but I might watch that tonight just to see how they are doing along with Caleb Jones and Ethan Bear and um, Tyler Benson. Lots of players to watch down there that would be interesting to watch. Heard a brief review of Caleb Jones today from Ryan Holt, who's a uh, Condor's, uh, uh, covers some Condor's in Bakersfield. And he was just talking about his week-by-week -week incremental improvement. Like It's not like he had a hot run and then came down it's like uh, he's been steadily getting better according to Holt. well caleb jones played very well for the orders in preseason i he mean did. he did have a down game or two when they when they started to play nhl competition but um no more down than jason garrison ever looked in in those games yeah. if you ask me so um there's a spot on left defense to be taken uh for a young defenseman on the orders right now and maybe it'll be caleb jones has nine points in 11 games so far that's a pretty good uh, point total for a player, so we'll see what happens there. So, Bruce, the, the last thing we'll talk about today is Darren Dreger's comment. Ah, yes, okay. Uh, I guess there was a Red Wine Summit, Bruce. Sounds um, like it. Before um, Edmonton's latest win. It's the second one this year. They had one in New York earlier where they're yes, like yeah, McClellan's. Right. And so what did Dreger report, Bruce? Yeah, uh, well, Drager, this was on TSN's Insider Trading last night where they put their three big wheels, uh, Bob McKenzie, Pierre Lebrun, and Darren Drager on one panel, and they talk about all the bits of information. It's very cleverly named Insider tra Trading, and uh, they're insiders, and they talk about trades. 
uh, potential trades and certainly scuttlebutt. Drager's exact words, which I transcribed for a post I started to write before today's actual trade came down. He said he was asked about the uh, job security for uh, Todd McCollum in Edmonton. And Drager said there has been speculation, but he's safe for now. That was an enormous win over the Montreal Canadiens, 6 2 on Tuesday. So perhaps in some way that alleviates some of the pressure. Now, I know the big brass of the Edmonton Oilers met on Wednesday. That includes the likes of Bob Nicholson, Peter Chiarelli, Wayne Gretzky, Kevin Lowe was part of it. All part of that group. Not unusual, he says. But the message is, let's stay the course. Now, they've got Calgary Flames coming up on Saturday, so the pressure may have cooled a little bit in Edmonton, but it's kind of game by game at this stage. Yeah, and so that was very cleverly phrased by Dreger to not sound it. like a horrible negative. But <laughs> so we've essentially twice in the last since so there's only two months of the season, and twice the owners have had red wine summits to determine whether they should fire him or not. So, and and I think this is completely appropriate, honestly. Like McClellan has had three years with this team. Other teams, Chicago fired a coach who's mm -hmm. won three Stanley Cups as a 500 team, and they and they axed him. Um, there, there's there's whispers, uh, you know, they axed the guy in Los Angeles who who yeah. had a pretty good year last year. Did he not? Did he not make the playoffs last year? That coach mm -hmm. did they make it? I think they yep, did. And they got crushed in the first round, but they did make it. They made the playoffs last year, and they axed him. There's uh, whispers out of San Jose uh, yeah, from Adrian Danger. Uh, yeah. So Adrian Dager, listen, right? there's all this talk about, well, you can't change the coach too fast. Well, three years isn't too fast in the modern NHL, my friends. Three years is an eternity in the modern NHL. Todd McClellan has had his chance with this team. I honestly, I'm not quite sure how he survived last season without getting fired. And mm -hmm. it was only because of the argument, well, we've changed coaches so much, we have to have stability. Fair, okay, fair enough. You changed all the assistant coaches. You have your new team in new team of coaches that got the head coach back let's see what you, the, it's all about turning the turning this team into a winning team now and if mcclellan can't do it now um he's got to go and if and if it doesn't if shirelli doesn't bring in a guy who can turn the team around this year then he's got to go both of them this year that's how the dynamic is going to work some people would say shirelli could go first and it's not mcclellan's fault i just think that's it's, the way hockey always works is that the coach goes first because that's the thing that can be changed that might make a difference during the regular season. Change the GM, it's not going to make any difference during the regular season, I don't believe. Yeah. Change the coach and it might. So um, I'm I'm open to that and it looks like the Oilers are open to that and Todd McClellan I think is well aware of this and that's why he's oh, no. sending down players like Puliyarvi and Yamamoto and that's and Caleb Jones isn't playing, Jason Garrison as he's going with veterans. All the way. So... Um, He's he and he's got McDavid and Drysaddle. He's going with his gut McClellan. Good for him. Like he's got to win. He's got to coach this team the way he wants to coach it. Like go for it. See what you can get out of it because the, the window's short and you got to win. Yeah. Well, you talk about the coaching window. I mean, it's short for all coaches now that uh, Joel Quenville's been fired. Do you know who is the longest serving coach in the NHL with his current team? It's a question that'll make it's a bit Not of a head. Lad. Uh, that's a good uh, guess. Uh, uh, the uh, the answer is uh, John Cooper with Tampa Bay, who came up late in the lockout season, and he played uh, coached five full seasons there, and he's just starting his sixth full season. And McClellan's starting his fourth full season in Edmonton, and he surely, uh, I would guess, in the top 10, if you looked, if you did that category for all 31 coaches, McClellan would be in the – uh, up near the top than the bottom in terms of amount of time coaching his current team. It's actually probably something that should be worth looking up, but uh, uh, he's uh, he certainly had a, uh, you know, a, a good full chance to make an impact. So after last year's, uh, they fired, uh, they fired and fell back. And then last year they fell back. And if they don't rebound this year, uh, he's going to be done for at some point. And, uh, he may be in the top five, Bruce. Like, yeah, that's uh, very possible. Yeah, I, I, I'd have to investigate, but uh, he would be close to, much closer to the top than the bottom, with three plus years in his current gig. I say, just so, so much turnover at that. 
Yeah, it's I don't know if it's right or wrong, but it is the that is that's how the, that's how that gig works, and they're they're well paid, and they, they all understand it when they sign the contract. So mm -hmm. um, that's, that's why they always we sign to for it? at least yeah. one year beyond the current season, so that they know they have a golden parachute and a chance to sort of re re uh, establish themselves somewhere else. But uh, his. Um, uh, in terms of best before date, that's kind of right now. His team needs to be producing right now. It, it does. And and uh, Shirelli has said he's liked the structure and the compete level of the team and all but uh, two Great. games. Win some games. And, and um, I think he's that's generally a fair comment. Um, I The issue has been lar uh, in large part, I, I would say, goaltending. Mm -hmm. um, and now the well, coach is... the guy making pitch. the choices. Yeah, but now he's gone in a different direction. So the, the clown seems to be a bit more less stubborn than he's been in years past, and he's making moves a little faster, perhaps. So um, maybe he can make him fast enough and smart enough to keep that job. And if he does good, because he seems like a really good man, a good leader of men, mm -hmm. um, I, you know, outside the odd report from Eero Pakarinen. <laughs> so, so yeah. I, I'm an Oilers fan. I hope. I hope. I've been critical of McClellan. I hope he does well i hope he unlocks the full potential of this team and i think there's a chance he can do that it, you know i why not so well, last week on twitter i got this question that we receive multiple times every season dave you'll recognize this one why don't you grade the coaches after the games and you know 100 percent of the time that question comes up after a loss where people want to see you just trash the coach and i, I like to keep I, I i'll do it maybe once a year or twice a year around actually throw in a grade on the coach and <laughs> typically it's a one after a very bad <laughs> performance but uh enough to get but it's on a game by game basis it's not worth it so my answer to this fellow was a little different than my usual answer he said coaches do get graded every game on a scale of zero to two those are standings points um, <laughs> it's all yeah. about the results zero or infinity there are one or two. That's all. Is. <clears throat> Winning and misery, Bruce. That's yep. they get. They either get the win or they get the misery, and yep, uh, they also get the paycheck. All right, yeah. Bruce. Let's leave it there. Thanks for talking right. today. Yeah, and we'll be back doing our normal thing after tomorrow night's game in Calgary. Yeah. Thanks for listening, everyone. And in the mean meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.